welcome everybody to this conversation between Sonny and Sonia. And uh, before we begin, I would like to inform you that once you listen to Sony, either you will awaken the poet in you or you would want to read your poems in his august presence. So I would like to ask you to mentally prepare your... Uh, to either read or participate very actively Hello. in this session. So, uh, before we begin, actually yesterday evening, um, you know, I wanted to prepare for today's session. So, I set out to look for uh, my copy of Sony's First Contact. I have a shelf uh, where I keep books on poetry and I was searching and I couldn't find it. Then I looked in all of my other shelves. I looked uh, everywhere, drawers, cupboards, and I couldn't find this book at all. And I thought, now what am I going to do? Then I paused and I thought, if I think about it, I realized that I know most of the poems in this book almost by heart. I know what it contains because I've read it multiple times. Sometimes these poems jump out at me when I might be doing something as mundane as shopping for fruits or reading the Malayalam newspaper. And why is that? You will know as this session unfolds. So I decided to stop looking because I realized that the book wants to stay lost like the poem that Elizabeth Bishop talks about. And then today morning I woke up and I looked through those places that I have already looked a number of times and I found my copy of the book. So I brought it along, but I really don't have to refer from it because such is the evocative power of this poet. So I would like to ask you, Sony, how did you come to find poetry? I think uh, the first time ever that uh, I began to think in poetic terms would be would be just after I turned 17 and uh, I had just left uh, the residential school that I had been studying for in seven years and uh, that one year just after school happened to be, what do you say, a watershed year is what you, I would like to call it. That was the year that I was diagnosed with a particular disorder which said that in time my muscles would lose their vigor and I would be confined to a wheelchair. But that would take about another 15 years, but I knew that I had already been sentenced. And this was happening in a year when I wanted to join the armed forces, which was the essential um, aim of uh, my school. And I have a classmate here, sitting here today who actually joined the defense forces that year. So uh, that unpredictability of that time, the, what I would say is I did not have the dictionary to describe what I was feeling, the total state of uh, what you would call something very distant from normality. And that is when one day out with my father at the beach and uh, in a moment I started to think about myself and a few li lines began to come in. And this is something that happened in 91 and then I have been writing ever since. I can say that those lines must have begun to germinate in a mind that had just undergone a sudden metamorphosis, or rather to say, forced by fate. 
to write something that it had still not thought of so far so um sony is also somebody who has believed in building a community of poets and he believes in mentoring young voices so um is poetry something that happens in isolation or does you know having a group or a collective like that help hello yeah i think uh, there has to be the first recognition that uh, you have a funny feeling which you actually later call it poetry i mean there has to be a beginning of that phase when you feel like writing something how it comes out what form it comes out is what tells you whether it's poetry or prose and um, for that matter um being you can't teach poetry to someone but first you must recognize that you want to write poetry and then what happens is the company that you bring in in the composition of your poetry actually is a kind of hand holding and um, a poet needs to be recognized at least by some people around them not in terms of worldly recognition but i'm talking about a, a certain validity that you are seeking and this validity can often be your power initially before your own confidence comes in kicks in to be able to write on your own steam but there is a certain sense of nurturing there is a nurturing quality to have or write or create in a company so when is it that one becomes a poet is it a moment of self realization i think uh, despite the fact that i have been writing for a while now you know how poets do not want to call themselves poets this is what others do and uh, it takes a bit of con- it's probably the day that you decide to call yourself a poet you find yourself telling someone that you are a poet and uh, it didn't happen for me for a very long time but today i can say that i'm a poet and it took me a lot to say that because there were certain expectations that i had in my mind to meet a certain standard of poetry what i could call a passable passable in term i mean poetry in passable terms i mean what could be accepted as decent poetry so it took me a long time so um recognizing that you face a lot of factors when an inspiration comes to you and that you will be able to deal with each one of them bring them into your poem and finish it successfully that is bring it almost close to what you had seen it in your mind is the day you realize that nature can throw anything at you and you will still trump it uh remember i said uh, sometimes his words might just jump out at you when you're reading the malayalam newspaper uh you know there is there are a series of poems that he has written on malayalam alphabets now since this is the ka festival i thought this would be a, a good example and the way that you know he looks at certain of these alphabets and r- imagines them tries to tell us what these alphabets could be revealing to us or the the contours of the mind that they can bring out that's absolutely beautiful can i have the next one also please the and the next one yeah see this is my favorite Ah. snail boli yeah, dinasa yeah, yeah. yeah that one so uh, i i absolutely love this uh, particular poem because this has you know this mirrors exactly what i have felt about this alphabet i i'm not very good at reading malayalam so uh, you know this is what i felt so would you please read this for us before i read it i just wanted to give a little bit of background into how this poem happened 
my father was in the air force and uh, me and my sister and my mother we found ourselves going from one place to other every 3 years getting posted out and uh, because of that i never got the opportunity to learn malayalam as my first language and uh, being in kendra vidyalaya it so happened that english happened to be the first formal language that i learned so my mother of course felt that there was a shortcoming in me because i hadn't learned the mother tongue so during a vacation when i was 9 years old uh, she decided enough was enough we were in kayanglum my hometown and my mother decided to send me across to a neighbor's house uh, a chechi who used to uh, teach alphabets to those who were planning to attend kindergarten at that point of time and uh, so there i was sitting with 3 year olds i was a 9 year old and um, what happened there was we were supposed to write an efface what i mean is that on river sand which was on the flow we were supposed to write each alphabet and then to write the next alphabet you just had to kind of efface it with your hand so because i was getting introduced to malayalam alphabets for the first time i was not learning it as the alphabets i was seeing shapes i had seen before in my life because i was already 9 years old and i was exposed to life more than this 3 year olds so when i looked at ka and when i looked at cha and all these things they reminded me of certain shapes and um, when i started to write my poetry book and when i had decided that it was about the years before i mean my childhood because this is a let's call it an autobiography in verse so when i started out i wanted to write something in relation to my mother tongue with which i have the strangest uh, you know relationship and an exposure that was not usual as it happens for most people here so uh i knew that it was the first thing that came to me was the alphabet malayalam alphabet and uh, then as you give time to your memories you sort of realize certain details and i remember at that point of time trying to see certain shapes in it and telling my mother ഇന്ന് ഇതുപോലെ ഇരുന്ന ഒരു സാധനമാണ് ഞാൻ പഠിച്ചത് അപ്പോൾ വാട്ട് ഹാപ്പൺ വേഴ്സ് ഐ ലാച്ച് ഡോൺ ടു ദറ്റ് ഐഡിയ ഐ ട്രൈ ടു എക്സ്പെരിമെൻറ്റ് വിത്ത് ഇറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഐ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് റൈറ്റിംഗ് പോംസ് റിലേറ്റഡ് ടു ദ ഷേപ്പ് ഓഫ് ദ ആൽഫബറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഐ സ്റ്റാർട്ടഡ് വിത്ത് ആ ആൻഡ് വൈ ദ എൻറ്റയർ ലൈൻസ് ഇൻ ആ റിലേറ്റ്സ് ടു the shape of an elephant the front uh, the front portion curved in a, in terms of a uh, elephant's tusk uh, not a trunk yeah elephant's trunk so uh, i saw the similarity in that and i tried to write in relation to what we see in an elephant we are always told that an elephant never forgets anything and what do you need to study language in the first place you need memory right you need to remember what you have just studied and that is your first step into language and that's what i wrote about but since sonia has decided now that she wants me to read uh, from cha 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 yeah what does it look like yeah i mean of course uh, people can differ in their interpretation but i saw something that look like a snail so here it is this shell shaped translucent leaving a silvery trail the story we carry this feast of green spurning gravity the acrobatic tremble heedless of danger do we not see the jealousy of the wine growth quashed by the slowest of living out of nowhere a startling insight a hummingbird its beak painted in sunlight what remains in this sanctum of the present an ooze of leftover memory 
the fractured holds of a mollusk. Absolutely. Absolutely beautiful. Now, um, I'll just take you through some of them that I have scanned and brought. I would like the audience to request one more of these alphabetical poems. We have ka, a, and yeah, cha he's already read. So is it going to be ka or a? a ka or a, as in Malayalam? Ka? OK, they say ka. So could you please? Because it's the ka festival? OK. So uh, there was this thing that I forgot to mention. I was feeling very self-important once I had done this poem and then when it went to the editing stage and I was sitting with my editor and uh, he comes to this page and then uh, he's obviously he studied it over the previous day and then we are discussing what else could happen with this poem, whether anything needed to be done. So he said right away that I like the idea of it but it's been done before in Chinese. So uh, I felt punctured for a few minutes before we decided to continue with the editing. But uh, of course, this idea has been done before, though I was not aware of it at that time. I thought it was my discovery. Anyways, ka it is for ka for, ka for ka, yeah. Somebody said something? The steam train muscles through the Coromandel coast, leaving plumes of soot and vapor an exceller walks past, balancing boiled eggs, freshly ground pepper and chili powder. Pukish, the nine-year-old, looks away, hoping his sleeping parents won't hear the cellar. While in his reverie, the war comic slides lazily to the lurching floor. The battle in commando number 2915, King Tiger, moves to a barren smoking grassland. A turret sweeps into view over a rugged hump in its crosshairs, the exposed rear of an allied tank. So uh, uh, a car uh, obviously looked like a little tank to me, uh, you know, and uh, I think minus a gun, I think, uh, with a barrel in front, but uh, still there. And this is related to reading a comic at that point of time. In, when I was a child, there were these commando comics which were very famous. They were war comics. I loved reading them. So that's how I looped in my memory to the aksharam, as we call it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for that reading. Um, you know, in this book, it's often mentioned that there are two lives that are being written about um, and two aspects of a life. So. I just wanted to ask you about your take on life and how this is woven into your poems. Like there are aspects of everyday life, there are you know aspects of paintings that you have incorporated into your poems. So how is it that you see the world around you? Because I feel that that is very relevant uh, in terms of how people are writing poetry these days. So how do you see the world around you and how does it find its way into your lines? So there is this interesting Japanese uh, concept. I forget the actual name in Japanese, but uh, it talks about uh, the need to slow down, the, for an individual to slow down and to observe things. And uh, especially in this very frenetic, what you call frenetic pace of the world, uh, what calls for is that um, you need to slow down for a moment because a lot of what we do is simply led by the speed of the events around us. And uh, most often that may not be our original reaction. And uh, it is also quite evident that um, my seat in a wheelchair is mostly in an enclosed space and uh, most often all people walk or travel to see something to have new experiences. I have to find my new experiences in uh, seeing things again. 
of seeing them not as what they appear to me first, but what I can see more interesting in them, what's happening there beyond its appearance. And most of the time, I think that's what most poets are also doing, though to me, I think it is a, something that forces me to look at things which I think is beneficial considering that it gets translated on paper. But um, I think the new perspectives that I often see around me for the limited world that I see, unless of course I'm traveling out, thanks to my friends, but <coughs> most often there are things that we see in the very ordinary things around us, which you might not see because you are too much in a hurry. So. And now I would request you to, you know, you have treated us for the visual. Now I would like some, uh, you know, something for the taste buds. There is this magnificent poem that Sony has written, I mean, on a series of fruits, but uh, the one that he has written on the pineapple stays with all of us on account of the way that, you know, it is able to recall a certain tartness. It, it just comes upon you. So, may we have that please? Anyway, after this, they'll all be going for lunch. So, some pineapple would do us good. It's like an appetizer, you mean, yeah. Uh, this is a poem I wrote uh, for a prompt uh, while I was doing my online course with uh, the University of Iowa's International Writers Program. Ode to a Pineapple. Look at the clock of secrecy, what might hide within the gray-green spires. In the blueprint of an assault, countless flowers have fused into one, the dovetailing holes a labyrinth for seekers. Covet this wild crown, ignore its waxy battlements. Snub the pricks in your quest, getting closer to the truth. Armed with strange love, cut through its armor, everything that restrains change. Shed of weight, it weeps gently, the air suffused with fermenting sweetness. Cut further along its flanks, blind in diagonal, its many eyes one by one. Sightless, it yields under a resolute sun. Observe the wedges lined with tiny honey traps. Prepare for a countercharge on your senses. Thank you. And at this point, I would like to, you know, ask your opinion on, um, you know, the, should poetry be very direct? Like, you say exactly what you feel. Like, I walked in the sun and I was hungry and I sat down under a tree and there it ends. Or, you know, should poetry be able to ask people to peel the layers, to look beneath it, to, to sort of look for a, a, a reimagination? Should it be a, a complex prism or should it be a window pane? What do you think? I think uh, the poem dictates the form, I feel, and uh, also the craft in it. Uh, the idea sometimes comes to, in, comes to you in a very indirect fashion, um, but how you present it can often, how you choose to present it can often decide how direct or indirect your poem is going to be. But I've quite often seen that when we are dealing with our very innermost emotions, we tend to be very indirect. Um, and at least that's what you would see in my poetry. And um, I choose to balance it with the directness of certain, like I said before, the various things I see around me. And uh, when I say it, it is not exactly direct, but I am talking about a direct experience which is behind the direct experience. I guess you understood what I meant. Yeah, uh, I as did. In, uh, it is a second looking. No, because sometimes I feel that, you know, when you write something extremely direct that is bereft of symbol or that just talks about, you know, things on a, on a flatter plane, 
you have told people exactly what to think and to try not to think beyond it. Yeah. There's a certain, uh, in, let's say, instructional tone yeah. which doesn't allow or maneuver for imagination. Yeah. But with a poem like this, yeah. you know, you, you kind of open a number of <clears throat> avenues for the person to relate to, for a person to not relate to, uh, you know, to, to imagine. I think uh, you have to leave it to the reader what they would like to make out of a poem because it's a subjective experience and uh, a poet is not exactly manufacturing poets, poems in a cookie cutter fashion. And uh, when you are doing that uh, and because this is language and we know how inadequate it can be in um, conveying an idea, what happens is that in poetry, which is also <coughs> spoken in its, uh, uh, I mean, spoken against it, which is said most often against it is its lack of clarity. <laughs> and uh, because uh, lack of clarity is a, a very delicate place where uh, both poets and non-poets can take advantage of it. I think it is something that doesn't need much explanation. So, you know, I'm going to ask you this, you can choose not to answer. But, you know, what kind of poems do you sometimes read and say, I wish this was not written? I think every poet is, uh, ultimately, I mean, in the act of poetry, I mean, doing it over and over or writing it over the years, realizes that you are snatching something from silence in order to put it on paper. The poet's ideal state is silence. That is the best point. And uh, when you say slow down, that's obviously what it is. Because when you talk, you are letting out something into the world. But what tells, wh wh how is it true that by only talking that you can make yourself clear? We can sit in the same, we are sitting in the same hall without saying anything to each other too, by, just by poetry itself. There is a certain understanding that's coming, isn't it? Um, Anton, but, sorry, you were saying? Yeah, so uh, silence is what a poet would ascribe to, but if he can say something better than silence, then please go ahead and write, if he feels so. And uh, if, he fe uh, if he feels so, is a something that is a qualification in the sense that various or different poets will feel differently about that. Some will be so good that uh, they will r uh, kind of answer an idea only if they find merit in it or that it really needs expression. But you remember when you have started writing poems, when you are young, when you have just started it, you will see a profusion of, you want to express hundreds and hundreds of ideas, everything in poetry. I want to brush my teeth, doesn't need poetry. But it also becomes poetry, isn't it? It can. If you find an interesting perspective. So on that note, I would like you to read Things You Believe. And uh, it's got a, a script that says, Ambala Mukha Tirunanthapuram 2018. For those who are not from here, Ambala Mukha is a place in Trivandrum and uh, it's where Sony lives. Now you know where he lives. Um, that's page 96. So because this is a memoir, um, situating each poem in a certain place, tells, a, you know, I mean, brings forth a timeline, because it's a memoir, obviously. But I think uh, now when I look back at it, this book came out in 2020. I think the book could uh, be okay too, if I hadn't done that too. I mean, like situated it in a place. But um, this is about things you believe. I had begun to think this is way past over. But like a comet, you cut short my sleep. I am floundering, a slow wake of dust hitching the rhythm of elements. 
The whelming waters have climbed through the night. I taste only brine. Such things I don't see coming. How else have I let myself believe I breathe when I'm drowning? The border has been crossed. A new air, a new tongue. But I don't remember the name of this place. What strikes me, I have sought refuge in a town unknown, full of faces I have known. Be warned, wait not for the night, it's anyway here, in this now stay. Tell me, this is indeed light, how convincingly you told me so every time. Love, you lying ball of light, hurtling somewhere, leaving a tale of debris. Absolutely beautiful. And Sony, talking about you know the things of the everyday, um, I would like you to read this poem called "Grief" that had appeared in the Bangalore Review, right? So um, it it kind of reminds me of Ted Hughes's Thought Fox, but it has been uh, the imagery or the animal imagery has been employed to entirely a very different use. So I would like you to lend your ears to "Grief." I have it here. I need the phone. Grief comes to us in many ways. It necessarily doesn't have to be about death. But the little deaths that we suffer in our lives, it can be the loss of a friend in terms of, no, I mean loss of a friendship basically, or uh, loss of a relationship. So many ways in which uh, loss becomes the reason for grief itself. And um, I remember participating in an undertaking that had uh, had given my efforts to for a few years. And uh, there was a time of crisis and I felt that we had lost our way. And it took me a while to accept what was going on and this poem was born out of that moment. Grief. A silent shot from the shrubbery, blur of black fur. Its stunning speed inbound snuffs out the sun behind it. The deserted forest path witness to one of many ways a walk on the spur can end. A sloth bear this page can't ever hope to hold. The foreign body slants hard into your space, a starless, smothering blanket of beastly order. Pinned down, your mind sifts and sifts through the shocks swiftly recalling the ranger's warning. It always goes for your face. Cover it with your hands. Curve your body into a sea and be still. And let your spine answer the swat, swipe, slash, and smite, reassembling, <coughs> born, brawn, blood. The world drifts in and out till your nebulous eyes spy a shape, slink away to the fringe, and the sun bounced back in like another surprise. Your howls mauling the silence till sirens, lights, and pallbearers arrive to howl away what's left of you to fix. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the power that poetry can wield. Okay, so I would really encourage you to, to read poems uh, of Soni Somarajan. And now to show us that, you know, he is after all human, we have a poem by him called Ten Year Challenge. So. Yeah. I remember reading this poem back in uh, 2018 at the Madhubhumi Literature Festival. So this is a repeat of sorts. But I, I think most of you remember there was this 10 year challenge when you had to post uh, photographs from 10 years before on Facebook and then you had two photos and then uh, basically people go to see who you were 10 years ago as in your face. So, hash 10 year challenge. And when we have gazed enough, the self of ours a decade younger, and wonder if a strange algorithm has been at work preserving you and me, but growing in unimaginable ways, making love and seldom unloving, the pink of our cheeks growing rich and waning, the animal within colder, Consider ourselves wiser or not that this might be life's attempt again to find attention, to rejoice in who we are, or maybe just observe 
the passing of irrevocable time. That's very true because I look back uh, uh, at these 10 year kind of challenges and realize that five years ago I was very different. There are students here who are blinking twice at me now. So, so uh, thank you for that, Sony. Now, before we conclude, I would like to ask you what you think uh, when you think about this vast world around us that is supposed to be so diverse and yet we are forcing it to be, you know, so uniform, so run of the mill. So, uh, you know, w what do you think when you think of this world and its... I think uh, even as a country, we are facing that challenge, isn't it, today? And uh, there is this uh, immense pressure to conform. But uh, we all rebel in our own ways, sometimes writing between the likes, like uh, writing between the lines like poets do. So uh, what I would say is that I come from a background where um, everybody around me sets an agenda for me, which is what you would call an ableist uh, sort of a agenda. So, uh, in some way, there is this pressure on me to be absolutely inspiring so that people can tell stories of me that despite my difficulties, hey, here I am fighting it all the way. So, uh, I think uh, that comes from a very ableist agenda where uh, but I can't blame anyone because I used to believe in that. And my idea was I have to be doing better than the normal people to be counted. I don't know how much this is making sense, but people with disabilities live in an ableist world and we are told what normal should be and that you have to succumb to the notions of normalcy. But uh, everything becomes slightly easier when you recognize this truth and because we, we have to keep re-educating ourselves all the time because we are all a work in progress and Every time we see something that is very conservative but which stands against the very notions of civility, very notions of transparency, very notions of accepting another as your equal and to be, to have the right that you, ha you can and you will exist along with them in this world irrespective of barriers or any man-created divisions, it becomes, for me, it was a lot of freedom to free myself of what others expect of me. And uh, I think uh, when we are being told how we should think politically, how we should uh, think religiously, we have a choice not to subscribe. You know, all of this evening, uh, afternoon, I've been uh, listening to Sony and then watching you people. And it reminds me of this, these lines by T.S. Eliot that I'm going to paraphrase. Um, all evening in these rooms, people come and go, speaking of Michelangelo. So it, it's like that. So I hope that people who walked out uh, carry some of Sony's words with them. People who walked in will also listen and take some of these words back with them. Uh, because I feel that uh, a person like Sony, when he, when he writes, uh, the, the power of his words and the sincerity of his purpose comes through as a mentor, as a friend, as an editor. I would have touched upon the editorial aspects and its importance and the way that he talks about it, but I think we are running short of time. So there is a very evocative poem that very fittingly comes at the end of First Contact, which is the Lone Petrel. If I may ask you to read that, we will conclude our session with that, if, and then move on to you know, question answers. 
The Lone Petrel is the last poem in the collection. The Lone Petrel. Uh, slightly explanatory note. Um, the, lo the Petrel is a bird, a seabird, and it's named after St. Peter, and St. Peter was said to have walked uh, on water, and uh, I mean, just like Jesus did, and uh, St. Peter did the same thing, and because this bird flies in such a way just above the skin of water, it seems like he's walking on water. So the lone petrel, and they are usually seen alone. The silence is what remains now. Everything's the opposite. The resonance of everyday chatter, a lone petrel thrown off flight by the absence of magnetic poles. The petrel walks the faith of saintly Peter. Sometimes we must forget we once flew and skim the water, keep hope afloat that love never perishes in a storm. You know I won't seek you again. Love is greater than you. You took everything, lightning, salt, the powering wind. Now that I walk the waters, I know I will live despite you. Thank you. And do we have any questions? Anything that you would like to ask Sony or uh, any poems of yours that you would like to read in his presence? And a, a perpetual fan of your poetry, uh, I would really love to know uh, your thoughts on form and content and how you negotiate both. And what is the entire process of writing that goes into your head, your imagination, as well as on paper or on computer? Uh, initially, in the period when you, are, you have begun to write poetry, you are very aware and conscious about uh, the craft of going about composing a poem. But these days, let me speak about what's happening right now. Uh, these days, uh, when an idea or a phrase or something that a friend says or uh, something I hear in a movie or whatever be the inspiration, uh, I generally think that this is worthy of probably being reflected in a poem or I try to capture its spirit and then I look back into my experience also and when sometimes when the poem comes it is in a complete form it almost writes itself but in other times I do think about it and I do think about it in the sense that I'm not actively engaged with it but it happens to be at the back of my mind and then what happens is uh, on a day, some day, when I feel that I have enough to write about, uh, which is probably uh, 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 you know, sides of the inspiration, the very idea of it, if I have more information on it, I try to write it down. Sometimes it's just points, so I write that down. There is a certain bullet point uh, face to it, and. Uh, then the final act of writing is when I think I have enough and I do that in one sitting because uh, I love to uh, 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 what do you call uh, play on the continuity so that it doesn't be uh, because you are composing with the disjointed parts so and assembling together uh, then again you write it in one go and then I wait uh, for a few days I don't have a deadline or anything I said for myself, you, know, you are very well aware of that, as is my first book took nearly five, six years. And uh, so uh, then what happens is that um, something that I really didn't do at the beginning of my writing poetry was to, do e to edit it. And uh, it has happened that sometimes during editing, uh, I see it differently. Once, that, uh, once I have not seen the page for a long time, then I decide that this is probably not gelling as an idea, then I rewrite it all over again sometimes. So uh, mine is a very slow, tortuous process of arriving at uh, a good flow, uh, the right words to use. Then at the, I mean, when you say, what happened to the idea that came in the first place? So it is between the lines. That's what happens most of the time. But uh, uh, I also sometimes 
poems that you or anyone else writes, sometimes they become an inspiration for me to write a response poem also. And uh, otherwise, uh, paintings and uh, things like that. What, what do we call it? What do we call that kind of poetry? Uh, 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 ekphrastic. Ekphrastic, yeah. So ekphrastic can be any image or it can even be a film or anything. So uh, often that, uh, in fact, in my first book, there are some ek ekphrastic poems which do not exactly say that they are ekphrastic, but they are, their basis is a picture or something like that. Uh, does this answer your question or is there any particular information that you wanted me to focus on? Babita is one of my early believers uh, in my poetry and then uh, I think she grew tired asking me when the first book will come out and when she gave up, I think that's when it came out. <laughs> so, yes. Hi. Uh, do you have any hard questions for me? <laughs> uh, as somebody who has known you for some time and the kind of effort that you take for writing poetry, like for example, I was quite amazed when I heard that you wrote the collection and then you disposed it and then you started writing it back. Uh, 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 I would beg to differ. The version is, I wrote a collection first. I was not satisfied with it. I dumped the whole thing. So that was about 50, 60 poems. So, no, they are not seeing the light of day anytime soon. <laughs> But maybe, but what I have seen is, what has happened to me is that sometimes I begin to write a poem and then I am lost. In the sense that I don't know how to complete it. Or rather, there uh, a certain part is missing in it. Or probably a good introduction is not there. How you walk into a poem and how you get out of it really matters. So sometimes I don't see that happening. So what I do is that I have left poems for two or three years and then returned to it. And then recovered it completely. I mean, no, it may not be the same thing, but use the same idea, but write it a different way. I mean, I absolutely love the whole collection. This is one of those few books that you read from cover to cover. There is this one poem called Jackfruit that I often turn it to my students or like uh, for just pure fun, uh, happiness. Uh, it's like my question to you is like, it's a very personal, it's a very kind of weird question, like in the sense that, do you have any of this poem in this collection where you'll take, ah, it's called Lala. Like you yourself wonder that how you came into this. Uh, I don't want to go with the answer which says that all my children are equally <laughs> important to me. Uh, but I would say, I think uh, pineapple is very important to me. And I'm not naming any of my poems that were written from a wheelchair experience. Why pineapple is because it made me think that I could be a poet. And that happened at the highest level that was when I was attending the program from Iowa. And I, it was written in that class. And that I could, uh, I mean, it gave me a lot of self-belief. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here with us for the life and times and narratives of Soni Somarajan, a poet beyond compare. And uh, what I would say was the greatest takeaway from this session was the interesting power that perspectives can lend you. The, the importance of having multiple perspectives and to understand that sometimes things are not just what they seem to be, that they can be much more. So next time you look at a pineapple, next time you look at the letter K or the H or CH, isn't it? Yeah, CH, you, you need to think that somewhere there was a little boy who looked at a boiled egg and an army tank and thought, oh, that looks like K. And I, I would like you to also bring those those prismatic perspectives into your life because after all what we are celebrating here is plurality. So let's, let's read into you know, everything, the immense possibilities, the immense pluralities that they contain. So instead of ending with something that denotes an ending, 
I would like to end with the poem that denotes a beginning. So, Sony, after that, we will come to the end of the session. Yeah. So, that, that one on beginning, please. Okay. It's titled, We Must Begin. Uh, I spoke about R earlier and the elephant and the power of memory. So we must begin with offerings to a power elephant time, for memory alone is what we possess. It's amusing, there is no evidence to show for it, a vapor of stories, things ephemeral these eyes have seen, the lips I have kissed. Every day is a degree of loss. The slow drip, a failing of light. The trails half eaten and time calls for a truce. Let's cut our losses. Love, the fulcrum of memory, you and me, custodians of a fading past. Let's bear witness to each other's story. Thank you so much for coming. Many people, much more people than I expected on a hot afternoon here in Trivandrum. But uh, so very happy to join in this prayer of poetry together to partake of this experience that's bigger than us. Thank you so much. Thank you.